here are some Fukushima facts. As long as we can call them facts, because I don't really know if we can get any reliable information at all, or if any information from the media is reliable. Um, well, the, the amount of information that is incoming from the media is also diminishing, as public interest seems to be diminishing. Well, but my interest is not diminishing, and it seems that a lot of people here have questions, like, about food. Um, the problem is, this will be what you could expect from a nuke. You could expect um, a fallout in a circular shape, and you could pretty much predict where the worst uh, destruction and the worst fallout would go, depending on wind direction and all that kind of stuff. With Fukushima, it's um, a lot more uh, difficult, because there hasn't been just one explosion, but there was the release of radioactive material and random times, and sometimes more, sometimes less, and the wind speed was differing. Yeah. Say that is Fukushima right over here. Um, you have a hot pocket here. A hot pocket would be uh, drastically increased radiation level. You could have um, an area with less radiation here, closer to Fukushima, than in that spot here. So it's really impossible to tell, like, okay, you can eat stuff from here, but not from here, and I don't know. It's really impossible uh, to predict which stuff you can eat. It's a little more simple for uh, seawater, at least uh, when it comes to the area that is right around Fukushima, because um, there are things called algae, algae, I, I have no idea how to pronounce it and couldn't find any info on that on the internet, so anyway, those things, and especially a type of them called kombu, which concentrates iodine, natural iodine, that is uh, just a non-radioactive iodine usually, and um, in theory, if you were to eat um, kombu, this special kind of algae, from just right off the Fukushima nuclear power plant, just right on the coast, it could in theory give you a dose of about 200 millisievert to the thyroid. That is an insane dose, 200 millisievert. That would be crazy. So that would be dangerous indeed. But it's impossible to predict what what exactly happens and how much will be in fish that is just in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Or it's it's really impossible to predict anything. But um, you should really watch my other video where I made a statement about Gaia counters not being able to detect minor contamination. Contamination that is still considered minor but is already dangerous to your health. You will not be able to detect it with a simple Gaia counter. Just click the link right down here now if you want more info about that. And otherwise let's see what else we got for statements. First of all, you sure heard about that irradiated worker. Uh, he was brought to hospital with like severe burns on his legs, like radiation burns and stuff. And you will probably know that he was known to have received a dose of 170 millisievert. It's like, what the hell? Or what the fuck? <laughs> if you look that up, you will see that 200 millisievert of an acute dose, which it was for that worker, produce just a minor radiation sickness with a reduced red blood cell count. How could he then have a radiation burn, a severe radiation burn from 170 millisievert? What the fuck, indeed. The radioactivity of major importance in nuclear power plants is, at least when they are often there are not many neutrons around, is beta and gamma radiation, and they both have a radiation factor of 1, so their amount of tissue damage is uh, sort of similar. Um, the, th the difference is that um, the beta radiation has a very short range. It is uh, densely ionizing particle radiation, which basically means it transfers all of its energy in a very short, uh, in a very short range, in a very short area. Um, let's take a look at the main uh, isotopes we've heard in the news, so iodine-131. Uh, the beta particles of iodine-131 have uh, a range of 50 centimeters in air, while cesium-137's um, beta particles have a mean range of about 150 centimeters in air, but in water they just range for about 20 centimeters. That's not a lot. Okay, now let's think. The range of beta particles, while they will deposit all their kinetic energy, is just 20 centimeters in water. 
and uh, humans can basically be considered like water, human tissue can at least. The bone density is a different thing, but human tissue can be considered like water. Okay, let's think again. So that guy was standing with uh, his boots, or maybe not even boots, but some random shoes, or probably bare feet, or who knows what he was doing, a poor chap, uh, was standing in this totally irradiated water. Uh, he was wearing a dosimeter that is down 170 millisievert. Okay, the dosimeter, at least in my country or in Europe in general, has to be worn at um, a representative spot on your torso, and that is the upper pocket of your protective suit. So that's a very closely defined spot in the um, on your upper chest. So let's see. Um, from water surface. I don't know uh, how tall that guy was actually, but from water surface to the dosimeter, there were about 90 centimeters. And the range of cesium's beta particles in air is 150 centimeters, in water 20 centimeters, iodine 131, just 50 centimeters in air even, and much less in water. Hmm, okay, so let's see. The beta particles were probably responsible for a very tiny fraction of the dose only. It was basically um, the gamma rays that were also given off after the beta decay here in most cases um, and probably only those got here so they gave an so that reading on his dosimeter is his whole body dose but the dose on his legs is much much higher due to the beta particles also they said that proper boots would have protected him from these radiation burns so that mu must mean that beta particles are actually responsible for this because um, for example alpha particles are already shielded by the dead layer of skin on the outside of your skin so um, they cannot be, res be responsible for that um, gamma radiation would have got into all of his body and anywhere basically because you need at least three millimeters of lead to shield half of season 137's gammas so um, that would have been some hellish boots to wear, really. So, um, if just rubber boots would have protected him, then that means it must have been beta particles that are responsible. And also, if you take a look at common applications in nuclear medicine, you can see that this is quite plausible. For example, uh, the isotope that we always hear about uh, with Fukushima or with Chernobyl as well, iodine-131, is used in nuclear medicine to uh, treat, for example, thyroid cancer. Um, they give it in ablative doses, and that means they give it in doses that are high enough to destroy the whole thyroid. You just receive it as a pill, it goes into your stomach, it gets um, taken up by your body, it gets uh, deposited into your thyroid, and your thyroid gets destroyed. The dose of beta radiation to your thyroid, which ranges about two or three centimeters in that tissue is really deadly to your thyroid and the side effects of that are just basically a sore neck maybe you're feeling a bit weak because uh, well there's a sort of inflammation response going on but you got no radiation sickness your brain will be fine you will just have a bit of a sore neck but your thyroid that organ will be completely destroyed by the radiation so you can see how range matters and that's the explanation why this guy just got a, a dose that doesn't even cause minor radiation sickness as a full body dose yet received very dangerous radiation burns on his legs which were probably exposed to local doses of a couple of sievert that is one sievert is a thousand millisievert so yeah the other thing you probably heard about is the recriticality or neutron pulses they said they could measure neutron photos somewhere. Um, I'm not, of course, we never know if this is all true or who made that up or who posted it or if TEPCO even know what they're doing because probably they're not. But let's just assume that we actually did see neutron photos and they were actually real neutron photos. So let's see what happened. Okay, the reactor shut down and the control rods and safety rods and everything were in. And once they're, when they're all in shape and all aligned perfectly like this, and that's good, there is no criticality. But if things get hot and uh, all those rods come out of shape, then that means danger because that means that there could be a blob of fuel, of uranium fuel and uh, fission products and all that, 
just below the reactor. That's what they were also suspecting. Uh, it's it's clear that the rods are not neatly in shape as here, but they're a lot more like. Well, we don't know what is exactly going on, but it's quite sure that due to the high temperatures, they're not in that neat shape anymore. So, uh, what we got on the news is that adding water to cool the reactors usually produced steam. Uh, Tepco usually said that would be uh, like a sign that the cooling really works and that it's all good and stuff. Well, let's see. Okay, so they added water and there was steam. Well, that makes sense. It could be because well, if water comes in contact with hot stuff, then uh, steam, but I think there, there might be also another reaction responsible for this. Because, um, as far as I know, the steam didn't uh, occur directly when the water was in injected, so it's not like the water was directly vaporized again. But it only occurred after a while, and the water basically began to boil, but just after a while. Why just after a while? So, let's have a look at that. Water is not only a coolant and used to, well, turn into vapor and uh, power the turbines and stuff in the running nuclear power plants, it's also a neutron moderator. The fuel in a nuclear reactor to a very small uh, amount undergoes spontaneous fission, which means that even without a neutron source that splits the atoms in presence, it will sometimes split all by itself. But usually that's no problem with all the control rods and stuff in place. But if there's enough uranium in one place, it can become critical due to those neutrons it releases by undergoing uh, spontaneous fission instead of the usual alpha decay. Goddamn police. Come on. Come on. Let food protect you from radiation. Just kidding. Anyway. Okay, we can continue here. So, from that fission, without any other neutron source uh, in presence, we just got like probably a bit of plutonium that spontaneously fissions and a bit of uranium that spontaneously fissions sometimes instead of undergoing the usual alpha decay. We get quite fast neutrons. For every fission, spontaneous fission of the radioactive material, we get about one to three fast neutrons. They're really fast. You can see them here. Uh, what happens with water? Water, you know, is H2O or dihydrogen monoxide and uh, the hydrogen is just basically one proton ah, the light water anyway, it's just one proto proton and uh, one electron on the outside the positive charge and the negative charge and that's basically all the atom so that neutron comes in here and sort of bumps with uh, the, uh, the hydrogen atom and loses energy and goes to the next atom of hydrogen in the water and bumps again and becomes slower and chillier and finally becomes a thermal neutron which means it has the resting energy of um, the atoms in the, in the solution basically. So what happens then is that uranium-235 will really really love that thermal neutron it really, really likes thermal neutrons and it wants to take them into their core. This is called a neutron cross section, which is de defined in a unit of Barnes. So, for thermal neutrons, for that kind of thermal neutron that has just been slowed down to uh, a thermal neutron because of water, without water it would still be a fast neutron and it would go past the uranium 235 atom without anything happening because it's too fast for the uranium 235 atom. But if it has. Um, a thermal energy, the uranium-235 atom will gladly take it up and fission. And that will release, again, one to three more little neutrons here. And that can again, if they are moderated, if there is enough water around, they are moderated, they can fission new uranium atoms. And so on, and so on, and so on. That's a fission reaction. So, let's see. 95% of heat in a reactor are actually generated by fission. Uh, only 5% of the heat in a reactor are from the decay products and stuff. The heat that you get from the short-lived radioisotopes and the reason why you have to store the fuel elements for a few years before you can safely deposit them. So, okay, let's see, 95% of energy in a nuclear reactor 
Now this critical come from the fission of atoms. Only 5% are from the short-lived radioisotopes that decay. Okay, let's see. So we put water in there and it takes a while and then it will all go up in steam and steam even more and steam even more and then be gone again. Hmm. To me that sounds as if, well, the water hits a subcritical mass of the fuel that has probably melted into a blob or something. We don't know. Uh, the water hits it and the neutrons that would otherwise rarely fission the uranium-235 atoms get moderated from fast neutrons into thermal neutrons which fission the uranium-235 atoms which produce even more neutrons and a lot more heat and that just basically boils the water away. So, sounds plausible to me. I'm not saying this is definitely the case, I'm just saying it's really, really plausible in my opinion. So, yeah. Once the water is gone, chain reaction stops, and so on and so on. That uh, principle is nothing new, by the way. Just Google for the natural nuclear fission reactors in Gabon. Nature actually produced a situation like this on this very planet. You can just look it up. It's pretty cool.